When is a movie not real? Spoilers ahead for the new Ryan Gosling, Emily Blunt joint, The Fall Guy. The Fall Guy is a film about filmmaking. More specifically, it's a film about the treachery of filmmaking, the processes by which illusions are created, the curiously thin line between the high-octane action we see and the pantomime acrobatics we're actually looking at. The strange part is, though, that after establishing this, after an opening montage of action movie curtain pulling, we get an action movie. For much of the runtime, The Fall Guy is an action movie. An action movie about the fakery behind action movies, but an action movie all the same, even if it does habitually wink to the camera. And it does. In The Fall Guy, protagonist Colt Seavers smashes into a lot of different surfaces, windows, cars, but maybe none more so than the fourth wall itself. An early sequence has a producer rave about a record-breaking octuple cannon roll within the film's fictional Dune Mad Max pastiche, Metal Storm. But the film actually did that stunt for realsies, and it was record-breaking. There's some of the most obvious, most conscious foreshadowing you will ever see. When Colt gets manacled and put on a boat during the second act, there's no doubt whether the earlier mentioned fact that he can jump a boat with his hands tied behind his back will become relevant. You know it will. And let's not forget Chekhov's prop gun, either. The Fall Guy is a movie about the fact that movies like The Fall Guy aren't real, are hyper-produced artifacts, a world away from any direct experience, and it makes that point, tells that story through trading in on other productions. The Fall Guy pipes in emotional resonance from licensed retro hit after licensed retro hit, and some of its most memorable moments of dialogue are lines from other movies. A good deal of The Fall Guy, perhaps the most substantial part, is essentially bricolage then, magpie art constructed of borrowed pieces. And those productions, those sources of meaning the film scavenges from, well, they're not exactly real themselves, are they? In 1983, French philosopher Jean Baudrillard wrote on a phenomenon he called the procession of simulacra, and simplifying ruthlessly, this was a four-step process by which the sign had usurped that which it signified. We might imagine a first stage, where signs, images, representations accurately reflected an underlying reality. Imagine taking a camera and just filming an event. No edits, no selection, no bias. The next stage is the unfaithful representation, something which claims authenticity but masks, denatures the real. Imagine someone using that footage down the line to make a biased documentary. It is still there, it's just twisted. Stage 3 is when the sign claims to represent the real, but no longer does, even indirectly, is a copy with no original. We might imagine the stereotypical dumb war movie, stock script writing cloaked in the garments of historical accuracy, garments which aim to buy, and often succeed in buying, viewer credulity. In Baudrillard's final stage, though, forget reality. Signs only reflect other signs, and make no effort to claim authenticity. It is pure simulacrum. To define that term real quick, simulacra are basically human-constructed stand-ins for reality that end up replacing the original. For an example, Baudrillard would famously claim a while later on that the Gulf War didn't really happen, that it was, in fact, a simulacrum. That is, that the narrative the mainstream media fed to the Western world between 1990 and 1991, the idea of the Gulf War that this constructed in the public, was so far removed from the actual affair, which was more a one sided atrocity than anything resembling a battle, as to be practically non-existent. Were he writing today, he might have made the same claim about the so-called war in Gaza. And that's stage four of Baudrillard's process. Thinking outside of film, take something like a Renaissance fair, which doesn't reenact any pre-modern reality. It only reflects an inaccurate idea of the olden days created by fiction and fantasy. It's signs reflecting signs, turtles all the way down. This is what Baudrillard terms the hyper-real, as in beyond reality. And there are a lot of films you could consider hyper-real, even ones now considered classic like Airplane or the original Star Wars, orienting itself as it does not around any reality but around other false copies like westerns or Buck Rogers serials. 
but to the modern viewer, examples like these almost feel quaint. In our age of the missing fourth wall, our age of the lampshade, it seems like there's a movie every year or two that delights out loud in its own non-reality, in a sense of almost overbearing pastiche. When is a movie not real? When it's hyper-real. When it's this hyper-real. When it builds itself inextricably upon and around other signs, and makes no claim to the contrary, tells you it's doing so every other scene. These are movies that aren't real, that are so far from the real that it may as well no longer exist. So how do we still enjoy them? How do we still connect with them, get something out of them? Well, is there really that much of a distance between a movie like The Fall Guy and any other? After all, when you get right down to it, no movie is real. At best, a movie's a reflection of the real, but even then, anyone past the age of five or so knows that's the case, knows the explosions are stunts and the aliens are made on a computer. How do we enjoy any of it? In his book Interpassivity, The Aesthetics of Delegated Enjoyment, Robert Fowler suggests the basic pleasure of a spectator seems to consist of creating and splitting off another character who serves as a backing for the illusions one does not share but still finds great. Fowler's reached this conclusion after an example from the French psychoanalyst Octave Manoni, which I'll relate in Fowler's English because my French isn't that good. Imagine an actor on stage who, while playing the role of a dead person, suddenly gets a tickle in the nose from the stage and sneezes. Of course, the spectators burst out in laughter, but what are they laughing about? Since they themselves knew quite well that the actor was not dead, it seems they are laughing at the imagined astonishment of somebody who did not know what they knew. Fowler subsequently forwards Jonathan Culler's idea that the pleasure of reading comes from imagining what a reader would think, that reading requires one to work with the hypothesis of a reader, and ultimately this imagined other, the figure Fowler terms the naive observer, becomes central to the structures of aesthetic pleasure Fowler explores throughout his book. From this perspective then, enjoying comes not through belief, but through acting as though you believe. The reality reflected in the object of your attention, or the lack thereof, might have nothing to do with the process of appreciation. But remember, that's only part of it. Whether or not reality is reflected is important, but so is whether or not that reflection has any interest in hiding its veracity. Maybe nothing changes if the sign, the film, claims authenticity. Maybe it's only necessary for the film not to reject it outright. But what about a film that does, that delights in its open artificiality? What about a film like The Fall Guy? A film whose bones are bricolage, whose skin is pastiche, and whose words are quotations. A movie that is hyper-reality on a film reel. Enjoying The Fall Guy, at least in the way it wants to be enjoyed, requires you to maintain eye contact while it winks at you, and there is no observer naive enough, real or imagined, to suspend their disbelief throughout that process. How do we enjoy a piece like this? To be clear, we did enjoy it, the reviews are in, but how has this happened when reality seems nowhere to be seen? Curiously enough, The Fall Guy answers our question itself. What is The Fall Guy? Again, it's a movie about filmmaking, about the making of these illusions. Yes, they are illusions, are unreal, but they are made. People make them. People are stuntmen, stunt coordinators, PAs, producers, directors, VFX artists, and so on. In The Fall Guy, we see the culture of the set, the culture off the set, the long shadow cast by on-the-job injuries, and much more. And all this tells us something important. Even movies which aren't real, are real for the people whose lives are making them. It's true that, in large part, this behind the scenesiness works in service of the film's very meta sense of humour, works to build a frame upon which the film's references and quotations can be assembled, but it's also true that this isn't all the Fall Guy does with it. The real heart of the film, to me at least, is the phone conversation Colt has with Jodie in the second act, on that boat, where the stuntman thumbs up, the specific existing industry gesture that doubtless was given again and again on the sets of all our favourite movies, is transformed into the Rosetta Stone for Colt's character, his emotional problems, and just for a moment, masculinity as a whole. 
Look, Baudrillard was a great mind, but a lot of his big ideas were very abstract, were more worried about reality as a concept than reality as a lived thing. And I'm not the first person to point that out. So maybe reality is becoming meaningless, maybe society is becoming dominated by simulacra, but the construction of these simulacra is still a reality for tens of thousands of people across the globe. We see that in the film's third act, tying as it does the success of our protagonists, the stuntman and the director, the relative big shots, to the participation and effort of Metal Storm's whole crew. And we see that in the thumbs up speech, we see the reality behind this unreal industry being brought forward and transfigured into an undeniably authentic moment. So maybe we can care about simulacra, about hyper-real constructions, precisely because they are constructions, because they are made, because the stories of some people's lives are stories of those simulacras making. That's one answer the Fall Guy offers, but it does point us to another, wider-reaching answer too. After the thumb speech, Colt fakes his death, then manages to find Jodie. She's overjoyed he's alive, but assumes she'll have to abandon her film to help clear his name. Colt pushes back though, arguing that finishing the film is just as important. Metal Storm isn't just meaningful to them, it has the potential to be incredibly meaningful to a whole new generation of future filmmakers, and indeed, to catalyze any number of future tangentially related meanings. Really? It's not about the creator, or even the creating. It's about the audience. So maybe reality, maybe meaning, is a little more flexible, a little more relative than we're giving it credit for, suggests the Fall Guy. Think about those blockbuster quotes which import gravitas into cult scenes with Dan. Until this point, I've framed those as evidence for the film's non-reality, as bricolage and nothing more. But that's not the whole story, is it? When Dan quotes a movie to Colt, the effect isn't simply to wow the audience with a pre-generated badass line, it also tells us that these two have bonded deeply over classic action cinema, over these copies with no original. And it makes sense that this would be the case, that two industry pros would care about that industry's products, simulation, simulacra or no. Perhaps then, it's not merely the making of Simulacra that can be an authentic reality, but the viewing, reading, watching of them too. Maybe meaning is disappearing, maybe reality is being subsumed by Simulacra, but maybe it isn't. Maybe meaning is simply diversifying. Maybe the ways society transmits, warps, the real, have become more problematic over the past century or so. But who's to say any changes that have happened are wholly negative ones? Thinking about the Fall Guy, about the thumbs up, about Metal Storm prompts a conclusion. And I'm not going to tell you that conclusion's right or wrong, I'm just going to tell you what it is. Meaning, and that meaning's authenticity? These things aren't defined by a movie, or a studio, or a French philosopher, or a YouTube video essayist. They're defined subjectively, by every viewer, every time. So maybe movies like The Fall Guy, by some standards, aren't real. But your watching of a movie like this is real. Your memory of sneaking into Deadpool underage, the lesson you took from Taika Waititi's hyper-real Thor films about being a man, your responses, your interpretations, those things are real. Maybe they're not tied to some original, now-buried reality that generations of films and fiction and media have obscured and eroded. Maybe they sprung forth from a cultural compost rather than any raw soil. But they are your authentic, direct, lived experiences. And what can reality mean if not that? Thank you for watching this video. Make sure to come back soon for the over the hedge deep dive that's consumed most of my recent existence. If you want more Pillar of Garbage discusses meta stuff content in the meantime, I made a semi related video a few months back, which, along with nearly 20 other exclusive videos, you can instantly access for as little as £2 a month via a Patreon or YouTube membership. There's also a bunch of other perks you'd get, including a new one, early access to new podcast episodes. Yeah, I started a podcast. Anyway, I don't know, maybe check that out. Huge thank you to all my current supporters, the names you're seeing on screen now, especially Hanan, Daniel Golton, Magath, Ryan Emily, Something Something Capitalism Bad, Thomas R, and Weirdy Beardy, and I'll see you all soon.